The Football Show on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. The greatest football partnership since Shearer and Owen. I'm prepared to end it my can. Do it then. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Welcome, welcome to Thursday's football show. It's Richie McCormick here with you this evening, joined in studio by Irish Independent Soccer correspondent Dan McDonald. Two nights running, Dan. I should be so lucky. What's the next lyric? Lucky, lucky, lucky. I should be so lucky in love. Yes, very good. There we go. I, like, if you're going to talk about Stock Aiken and Waterman and late 80s pop, because they're in the midst of that, I don't know if you know, they repeat like Top of the Pops by year on BBC Four. Right. So they're up to 1988 now. They started off in 76, showing year by year by year, skipping the odd one because of U tree reasons. Mm. Uh, and they're now into 88, and they're into the full you know, depth of Kylie and Jason. Oh, really, yeah. Oh, yeah, Sunita, I'll, all them. I only after discovered there's a channel on Sky called Now, like, Now That's What I Call, and it has, like, there was a Now 90s the other day. Mm. So it's obviously in the style of those, like, box tapes you got, you know, Now 23 and the likes. Can I, can so, uh, I discovered... Stuck in a vortex, like it was just added on for an hour. Like, this is crap, but I just, I still want to see what comes next. But it's best, the best thing about those ones is, about now I discovered a while ago, because you usually think, it's like, oh, they're just going to show random stuff from the 80s and 90s. On occasion, they go through one of those now compilations that you mention and go track by track by track. So, like, the top notes of, like, you know, tracks one to, one to four, you can kind of know. As soon as you get into the weeds of track 16 on CD2... Th that's some good stuff that's in there. When they, that's when they ran out of like oh. the rights for the better stuff. And yeah. It's like uh, this is a, a dance version of a Christmas song yeah. or something. Exactly. Towards the end of it. And that's where I feel at home. That's yeah. where I feel my best is where I'm into like Mary, track like, 16 Mary had a little lamb, the dance version or something like that, you know? Right next, the third single off the Cotton Eye Joe album. Yeah. Oh, that's anyway, stuff. speaking of backward and going back <laughs> and speaking, going back in time. Yeah, speaking of retrograde, let's go to Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, the Irish Football Association, we learned today, Dan, Ulster says no is the headline everywhere because the IFA have basically shot down the idea of a all-Ireland, all-Ireland league, now, which is floated, of course, by Kieran Lucid. There was a progressive meeting. I think everybody that I saw, as regards representatives last from the meeting last Thursday. Thursday. I was hanging around outside yeah. the meeting, yeah. Loads of people, Dan Lambert and from Bose is one of those, to speak really, really positively about it and say that the ideas floated, some of the numbers floated, and the general vibe around the thing was hugely positive. Today we got a statement from the IFA. Can I read it? You may read the statement. Do I do it in the accent is the question, though. Is that, is that in the spirit of reconciliation? Probably just, not. Is that, is that not just going to I'm fuel not, the... <laughs> I wouldn't say fuel the division now, that, yeah. that drives this mindset. I wouldn't say so. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read the statement merely. Uh, it says, Having listened to the proposals from Mr Lucid and his team, we believe the best interests of our member clubs and football in Northern Ireland are better served by remaining with the club-led model established in 2013 via the Northern Ireland Football League, NIFL. The potential income figures quoted in Mr Lucid's proposals are highly speculative and lack specificity or guarantees. UEFA competition places, prize monies and youth solidarity funding are important to our clubs and we do not wish to put these in question. We greatly value our association and club links with the Football Association of Ireland and are happy to both take part in and enhance cross-border cup competitions at all levels. They went on to mention the Unite the Union Cup, etc, etc. Basically, this idea on the surface appears to be a non-starter. Um, I, I guess, yeah, it's in a bit of bother now. The statement from Kieran Lucid's group, uh, you know, they, they did respond and just in the last sort of hour or so and, and basically laying out that they, they remain focused on their objective, which as far as they are concerned is, uh, I'm just going to pull it up, so the project we are embarked on is to support and improve the lot of professional football clubs on the island of Ireland. We remain focused on that objective. A considerable amount of work has been done to date. Clubs are being regularly updated and consulted with as we make progress. The work will continue. Now, the distinction here is that while the League of Ireland uh, then here is controlled by the FAI, the situation uh, north of the border is that there's the Northern Irish Football League, which is actually a sort of a third party association that is, I mean, it's a hybrid model. It, it works in conjunction with the IFA, but it's not controlled by the IFA. So the clubs have a certain say. And I think what, I think the hope of the, the Lucid group as such is that, that while this IFA statement is very worrying, um, that the clubs still have a lobby 
up north to come together and say, well, they reject the stance of the IFA and we, we still want to hear more for, about this plan and they could, they can maybe go back again and throw their weight around a bit because, I mean, this has been modelled to a degree on the, you know, the Premier League breakaway in 1992 and mm. the key word is, the key use is, the, you know, the key word is, is breakaway there and that, you know, if clubs get together, do they want it enough? Now, there's a massive question of whether they want it enough. I did say I was at that meeting last Thursday. It was positive, um, you know, and from some of the big northern clubs, it was particularly positive. Glentoran, for example, I spoke to someone from Glentoran who said, well, the meeting going out, you know, there's the feeling going out of the room is better than it was going into it. So when you have people maybe, and I, you know, who are open to talking about it, mm. that within seven days, the parent body up there would try to shut it down effectively isn't a very progressive step. I'm not saying the proposal is perfect. I'm not saying the proposal doesn't have flaws. I'm not saying that there isn't things within the proposal that need to be talked about and smoothed over to, to move to the next step. But I think the, the, the tone of, uh, of Ulster says no tone of just saying, well, no, that's it. Uh, it's not really allowing the idea to breathe. I, and it, it, would, it would be pretty deflating in that respect. But I don't think we've heard the last of it, but it's a big blow. This is like the third or fourth time that I've actually read it. Um, read it out in the office earlier on, read it before we came on air, and now read it to yourself. The more I look at the IFA statement, the more you realise that there actually is a little bit of wiggle room there if you're on the, the hopeful side of things, because mm. they mentioned the potential income figures quoted in Mr Luce's proposal are highly speculative and last, lack specificity or guarantees. That's basically a call to, well, if you can give us guaranteed numbers here and if you can specify where X amount of revenue streams are coming from, then maybe we can progress further with these talks or actually have these talks. And they also mentioned that UEFA competition places, prize monies and youth solidarity funding are important to our clubs and we do not wish to put these into question. It merely says that the idea is that they're possibly putting them into question and not necessarily cutting off anybody's legs here. So yeah. you, could, you could have room to, with a little bit of consultation with UEFA, with a little bit of consultation with other bodies that might be involved in like youth solidarity funding, et cetera, et cetera, that these things, as you mentioned, could be smoothed out. Yeah, no, and it is right to say that Karen Lucid's group have not provided the answers to some questions, but there's a chicken and egg element to their proposals and that they can't present they can't go to UEFA and they can't even sort of thrash things out with some sponsors until they have the approval to progress further in those talks um, and, and, and actually take something hypothetical and, and in actuality, you know, go to the associations. Like the last, like how this works, like the last step really should be going to the associations to say, okay, the clubs are with us in this. Can you give us the approval to go and, and you know, the green light to go and take this a bit further and see what happens? Um, and they haven't provided the answers yet. No, they haven't. But that's not to say that they wouldn't be able to provide them after further talks. I mean, the mm. way it was left last Thursday was that they wanted all the clubs, north and south, there was over 30 clubs represented. I think 32 out of 36 that were invited turned up. And um, they, th those clubs were meant to input, provide some data back to this Dutch company who are advising Lucid's group, uh, who are going to try and put some meat on the bones as such and, uh, and, and bring things to the next level. So it was very much a case of, well, let's just see how things go. And I think there was a wait and see approach from a lot of people there who might have been sceptical. Well, OK, let's see how this goes. Now, I did speak sort of off the record to some people involved with Northern Irish clubs last week who would be negative about the plan still. And, you know, as one said, um, you know, something like, that, well, there's no bones yet even, never mind sort of meat on the bones as such. And that would have been their view. But um, what's wrong with talking about it? You know why? And, and I do think, and I, I know that there is a softly, softly view, and not to be too derogatory about people, but there does seem to be a view. There's a contrast between, I think, the attitude of, of a lot of people involved with football in the south and the north, and that I think a lot of people involved with the League of Ireland, while they're very proud of the league and, and you know and and so on they're pretty unhappy with their lot and feel that the change is happening and ch change needs to happen. Whereas uh, north of the border, I think there's a certain pride and there's a, there is a view of, well, we're, we're going in the right direction. Now, their version of the right mm -hmm. direction is going from rock bottom to slightly better than rock bottom. But they would have the view, well, things are going in the right way. We're happy. And, and maybe, they're not mo maybe there are people there who just aren't motivated by full-time football. They're not, they're not motivated by uh, you know, professional football. They just think that maybe that might suit them, that, that maybe they have a certain view of, of what they want their league to be, which is different maybe to 
some people down here who believe that just the future should be a full time net. There's just conflicting views down here too about the viability of that. Um, so what you have really is a split not just between North and South, you have a split between people involved in football on this island, some of whom would think professionalism and full-time football is the way to go and that's what needs to happen. And there are those who believe that, that that's not the way to go. It just seems that there's more people in the latter category up North than there is down South. But I still think the likes of Linfield and these clubs, if they want to go full-time, um, they, they, they probably need something like that to make it sustainable over a long period. I think there is a sense, we were, when we were over in Geneva, we were actually talking about this idea with a couple of um, Northern Ireland based journalists who would follow the Republic in terms of their work, but we were talking about the idea of, of the All Island League and they were saying that there are a clutch of sides in the Northern Ireland Football League who are basically looking to go full time. So I think Linfield are already there. I think Glentoran would probably be another one, but the likes of Cliftonville and a few others are... Larne have had Larne. big money put into them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's more in Northern Ireland that would be in a position to motor away with something like this than there would be in the League of Ireland at the moment. And it, it, it's just the general sense that I get. I, don't, I, like, I personally don't know what Lucid's background is. You have more information on this than I would. It seems like the clubs in the South need something like this more than the ones in the North do. I think to a degree. I don't think the clubs in the north have even got to the point. They haven't even tried full-time football yet, so they haven't even got to the stage where they've encountered some of the pitfalls of full-time football within the negative funding structure that exists on this island for football. The clubs then said, have all tried full-time football to a degree. You know, all the Premier Division clubs have to a degree, with the exception of sort of UCD, maybe in Finn Arps. But they've all had tried a version of it, and some have been burned. Like, like that hasn't really happened in Northern Ireland. I mean, very recently, you know, you'd have clubs from Northern Ireland playing in Europe, and the manager or players would be on holiday. And there's very much an understanding that, well, and this this isn't what it's about, you know. Like we we play our our campaign along this structure, and this European stuff is a bonus rather than down here, where like Europe is the it's be all and everything. Yeah. It's everything. But that's that. But Europe has created an imbalance between the Dundalk and the Shamrock Rovers and the top teams and. The also runs. Well, Linfield have gotten a sniff of that. It's, this yeah, year, that's it's, it's way more. They, they refer the IFA statement refers to the balanced league that they have, which it is at the moment because no one has had any success in Europe. But if Linfield start to have it, then they will pull clear, and then suddenly they'll be like a bit frustrated by, well, being held back by this. Where match, are we yeah. going? Like I, under, I understand why there's reservations. Like there's 12 teams in the Northern Irish top division at the moment, and there's 10 in the Republic of Ireland Premier Division. In the Lucid proposal, there's a 14-team top division. So, through the sums, like, there's eight teams losing top flight status. And the way things are weighted, more teams in Northern Ireland would lose top flight status. Mm. And uh, I, I can appreciate why it's going to be a very difficult sell um, to them. And I, that, that was always going to be a challenge. But, like, I guess because they're only moving to a certain stage of the revolution, that they haven't had some of the setbacks that clubs down here have had. And, and I think that those setbacks are coming for them if they try to move full-time within the, the, you know, within the model that exists there. It just, it just won't work. So there's, a, like, there's all these internal, you know, domestic, people have their own status and people get emotively, you know, they, they clutch on to, they well, the these, these proud yeah. clubs. And, and, and I get that, and it's difficult, but look, what do we want football to be on, on this island? Like, what do we actually want it to be? That There comes a time where there has to be really hard decisions made that, that in the short term leave some people behind, but it's for the, the greater good of trying to raise the bar mm. collectively. Um, and I, as I said, I, I'm not 100% saying that Lucid's plan, that he is the messiah and that his group, look, I think they're trying, they're trying to rush things. And I think that that's probably a, a criticism that they're talking about a 2021 start, where maybe it should be a consultation process towards a longer time frame and say, can we move towards this and to move softly, softly and slowly towards it. But mm. I think to just abandon it completely straight away and say, and say the Ulster says no, is so short sighted and, and sort of delusional in the sense of thinking that no, we're going to be fine up here as it is. No, no, both leagues are struggling. Both leagues are in a bad place and they, they have nothing to lose in the sense of trying trying something different. Are you saying you know? are you saying this is the old sitcom trope of two slightly left behind people in the friend group who might not be as attractive as the others that are around them and are finding themselves being left alone, watching their friends go off and get married and, you know, live with other people whereas they're going, Do you know what? In ten years time if we still haven't found anybody, do you think we should like a pact get together you know, when we're forty or something. Exactly. Yeah. And we still haven't found anyone. No, well, I mean, 
I, I don't know how, how far we want to stretch this uh, and what their history might be. And Probably best not to delve. Yeah, let's, let's, not, let's, not, delve. let's not go too, too much further with that. But Instead, I, I just think it's, 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 def, it's, it's deflating to, to abandon it too quickly. Like, and for a governing body to come out and take that stance. Like, I'm, I, you know, if a club did it and said we're completely against this, but the governing body is trying to almost shut down a debate mm. and the, the tone of it is a bit, I, I find it very unsatisfactory. Um, so I, I just hope that that's not the end of it. Speaking of tone, Dan, when you're at the great, this club, a great club, you'll always get people like that, begrudgers and people who just want to knock everything you do. They talk about nonsense they haven't really got a clue about. We have to, had to listen to a lot of that from people within the game and from people within the media, but they don't know what they're talking about. We know what we're doing. We know where we're going. Stephen Bradley's programme notes from last week? 100%. Uh, strong He's words. He's well, right. I mean, if Stephen, Brad now, look, Stephen Bradley, if, if Shemek Grover's win the FA Cup this Sunday, I mean, Stephen Bradley is entitled to come out and give that speech again. Like, Stephen Bradley was basically in the eyes of the, the I suppose, the, the narrative of where things were going. He was gone last summer. I mean, you know, his own fans were, like, you know, sections of his own support were chanting for him to go. Sizable sections. After they Let's lost the game to Dundalk at home, 5-2. Yeah. Uh, and, like, that, that existed. That was a real thing. That doubt existed within the support of his own club. So, I mean, he's totally entitled to his Golden Cleric speech on Sunday <laughs> if, if, if things go well. But, I mean... Things still need to go well on Sunday, maybe first. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I have no problem with sort of him making that point, though. I can understand why. I'm sure in that time he probably was pretty angry or pretty hurt by some of the stuff that was said, and you know there was a lot of sort of mocking of the project. Anyway, I, I certainly, I think at one point, a couple of times, would have written that you know this project needs first team success to you know and there comes a point where their understanding can only last for so long um so i don't know if i'm in the firing line for that but i can you absolutely are but i can i can understand uh, what that view exists and you know rovers are at an interesting point in their history in that you know dermot desmond is coming in to to, to provide some backing the setup is, is very good there you know the they are like they're they're getting their act together in terms of the underage side of things. Yeah. They are like going to produce players, but they still they still need something to mark their progress. Like tangible success. They need yeah. they need like they've been good this season, but if they lose the cup final, uh, I think that some of the progress this season will be forgotten very quickly. Whereas if they if they win that game, well then they've got a picture for the postcard. You know they've ended their cup famine and it sets things off into next year. And in a weird way, you know for the league broadly. Um, you know, Ro Rovers winning would, would create some sort of hope of a contest going forward, whereas Dundalk winning would very much an assertion of their of their dominance. We need um, a good game more than anything else. On I hope it is. I think there's a good chance it will be. I think uh, there's a lot of football and players on both sides who there's no natural sort of stoppers. You know, people who are there to. Uh, you know, stop the other team from playing. I mean, Chris Shields is a very good footballer. He's actually, but a very also a very effective player in terms of you know trying to neutralise the impact of other teams. Mm. Um, I mean, he's the all-round midfield package, Chris Shields, and he's a loss to the game. But I guess in his absence, there's a possibility that Dundalk can end up having to whether they play Sean Hoare as a defender in there. That's one option, but they could also end up going for a sort of a Sean Murray, Robbie Benson in the midfield too, which means they have no option but to play. You know, and I mean the dog will try and play anyway, and Rovers very much so are a football inside. So like I I'd be optimistic about this being a good game. There's always the fear that it's just it's the cup final and you know that that a degree of nerves kick in, but I kinda hope they can rise above that. I mean it's the dog fifth year in a row going there. Um, and you know Rovers players between you know Jack Byrne has played at the Aviva, likes Ronan Finn, Joey O'Brien, Brain Burke. Burke. Um, they've all played. A lot of players have played on a, you know, on a good stage at a good level, and they, they'll be more comfortable in a in a good game of ball. And I just I just hope that people like you know people respond to it and that you know. I, I, one one game and one crowd doesn't mean anything. Like that doesn't mean that you know. Just let's just say there's a great, you know, run up to Sunday and, and there is a good crowd there and over thirty five thousand people mm. there. It's not like saying, well, this is this shows that the game is in great nick and people use it for promotional videos and say, yes, the league is going somewhere. It's not, but I think it's a step along the road for people that maybe if they're not going to go regularly, but they might be open to going to 
to come and watch this match. Like, if yeah. people, you know, if you're around Dublin on Sunday and it's not preaching, it's not sort of trying to, like, get out. I, I don't, that, that tone never works with people. But if you are sort of interested in football and you're in the area, like, there will be good footballers from Ireland playing in the Actual, Stadium. A, a trio this of Sunday. internationals are You know, so, for hours, yeah. like, I, I'd find it hard to, to fully get on board with, with, with the idea of sort of people who, who, who would just ignore it completely and say it's not their bag, you know. I think this is this should be a good game and a good occasion. Uh, one of those people who's not as thick with the media at the moment is the uh, Dundalk head coach, Vinnie Perth, and he spoke to our Jamie Moore ahead of what could be, well, a historic day for the club. Yeah, really looking forward to it. I think, it's, um, I think there's no doubt that the FAI Cup, in my opinion, has been devalued to a point this season. So I think this is an opportunity for both teams to put a, a day, a special day on, I think it's there's no doubt they're the two best teams, and just hope not every cup final is is brilliant, and I hope it's it's similar to the games we played against each other this season, where it's been good free flowing football and been a real showcase, and it's an opportunity for us to represent the league and and make people proud of what we have to offer. Why is it being devalued? Well, I think um, you know there's no doubt we've had like for example a quarter final we had to play on a Monday night down in Waterford and just throw in an old game against Cork on the Friday before that where we're trying to win the league we've had other issues and teams moved games moved so uh, this is this is the this is the showcase cup this is we should be very uh, proud of this cup so um, you know people have forgotten about that and maybe I shouldn't bring it up but I, I really hope we can we can finish it in style here in the Aviva Stadium News today that Chris Shields won't be available due to suspension what happened? Um, well I mean look this season we've had a huge amount of uh, adversity. We've had, you know, ridiculous amount of injuries. Um, impact. We've only had one muscle injury again. Uh, the semi-final that was Patrick played, and we had to play the fixture. Computer decided well, you have to play on Monday before that as well. So, um, so we've always bounced back. We've always been strong. Um, you know people like Chris play on the edge and there's always a fear of that but we've accepted it we move on we're prepared for it and um, we've, we, we've battled the hard way in this cup we've been in the middle of Europe we were down in Cove we've been away to Waterford away to Derry and away to Sligo so if we're going to win this cup we'll have to do it the hard way and not having Chris will make it a little bit more difficult than it needs to be Is there an argument given that you had won the league of maybe not playing him in the last couple of league games because he was on yellows or, or Yeah need... th look um, th there's loads of different scenarios and, uh, and I'll speak about that after the cup final the one thing we've never done is made excuses uh, in any way shape or form so it is what it is we'll accept it and move on not overly happy about it but there you go um, we have you know we've real competition we've worked on different systems with, with things like this in mind you know we've we've toyed around with three of the back for argument's sake so we've, we've a lot we can do and um, we're very comfortable with the squad we have Having had four cup finals here in a row will cup final week or cup final day change much or will it be same? No I mean I think the players are very experienced but at the same time it's a different it's a different day it's a special day it's one of the most special days of your life we've experienced winning here and we've experienced losing and I have as a player as well I've also experienced being left out of a team and, and being in a team as well so I get all of that stuff and it's it's difficult every player will want to play but we've a, we've a fantastic squad and you, you could debate our team all day long in terms of who starts so um, just a normal week for us in that sense but there's a little edge to it because it's it's uh, an opportunity for us to create a little bit of history and, and we'll go after it in the right manner and you know no matter what happens we've had a great season this year it's just a chance to finish it in style It's Dundalk head coach Finney Perth speaking to uh, our own Jamie Moore and I've just been told in my ear that Stephen Bradley has yes he has been okay to talk to our Jamie We try and keep training and everything as normal as possible obviously all the media that comes with, with the final uh, keeps on your toes and keeps you busy but other than that we, we try and keep everything as normal as possible and you say that nervous tension that yourself and the players have, that's a good thing to have before a big match, isn't it? Yeah, it always, I always felt I was as a, when I played and, and now as, as a manager before big games, it's, it's nice to get that. Like I said, uh, once, you, once you harness it and, and use it in the right way, and, uh, it can be a real positive. So roll us back to 2010, the last time you played here. I think it was the last time, did you play here after that or was it, was it 2010 the final? Yeah, 2010. Um, Sligo, obviously, we got beaten penalties, but... Um, yeah, what I can remember of the game was a decent game. Sligo were a good side then, and uh, and obviously the beat us on penalties. Would you have thought then that it would be nine years until Rovers were back in a final? I know you you weren't you know you're going to be the manager and stuff, but like it, it's 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 a, it's been a long wait. Um, look, I think when you when you get the games like this and, and uh, finals, you, you can't take them for granted because um, 
like you said, it's nine years. You don't know when the next one is, and you, you got to grasp it and, and really embrace it. And, and uh, hopefully we can do that this Sunday. Yeah, I spoke to Sean Kavanagh. He's not played here, but he's played a lot of games in the Championship. Jack Byrne and Graham Burke have great experience here. A lot of your other players have played in big games and big stadiums across the world, as have Dundalk. So it being here and in a big stadium and a big crowd, does that make much difference to, to how people will play and coach and stuff? No, I don't think so. I think, uh, like you said, they've obviously played here for a few years, so they're well used to it. Um, air players have played in a lot of big games uh, throughout their career with six full internationals so I don't see any of the stadium or the crowd or the pitch being an issue for, for either team I just see two teams that will uh, be going all out to win the game And the games against Dundalk over the last couple of seasons particularly this season again you know, they've been tight, they've been exciting will this one be any different to the ones you faced them against before? I don't think so I think like you said they're two really good sides uh, when we played each other it's been very tight um, it's been small margins in the games uh, some big calls have, have swung them games either way um, and uh, like I said hopefully on, on Sunday them, them small margins are with us but um, it's going to be a really good game And the crowd as well Stephen 36,000 here for that final you played in in 2010 the biggest of all of the finals so far been a great push of the last few weeks to try and get this even bigger and Shamrock Rovers has done a great job I love the videos of the uh, fans abroad coming home to watch the match and stuff what would you say to like a neutral who's not a League of Ireland fan that goes to watch Premier League games or watches Ireland on the telly and thinks League of Ireland is crap about coming here, spending 15 euros to come and watch the two best teams on Sunday? Yeah, well, you have two of the best teams in the country. You have full internationals on the pitch. You've got some fantastic footballers on the pitch. Uh, and if you haven't seen the game before and you come to the game on Sunday, I'm sure you'll walk away um, very impressed with, with what you see. Because it's a good chance, you know, to show, with, you know, debates at the moment about where the football is going and the FAI and... The, you know, debates about where the league is to go. Well, these are our two best teams in our best stadium, and this is what we can we can show you. Like, yeah, and I, again, I don't doubt that both teams will put their best foot forward. I think um, both teams are full of top players, and 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 they've shown both teams have shown on big occasions they they show up and they play. And uh, like I said, I don't see Sunday being any different. And lastly, I know you spoke during the week to the newspapers about your own job you've done and how excited you are to be there on the sideline on Sunday leading the team, and about maybe some of the sick you would have got over the previous couple of years as well. If you, your team could win this trophy, what would that mean to you as, as the manager, as a young manager, your first job and, and you know, a first major trophy if you can do? No, look, we, we'll, uh, we'll just concentrate on trying to win the game over 90 minutes and everyone knows what it means to this club and what it means to the players and the fans and the staff, everyone involved, uh, not just myself. So, uh, like I said, we'll do everything possible to, to try and uh, make that reality on Sunday. What year is your birthday? Around 87, 86? 84. 84, my God. I said to Sean Cavanagh, because he's 94 and I'm 89, that you might have been about three when Rovers last won the league. So that was actually, or the cup, that was, a, not the league, the cup. That was a decent guess, but you don't remember much about it, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I'm still, uh, still in nappies, obviously. But that history is something that the club has spoken about a lot. And if you could win the 25th as well, like just the wait and... It would just be amazing for your club, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, it would. It's, it's obviously, there's no going away from uh, how much it means to, to everyone involved in the club. Uh, we know that um, as a group of players, a group of staff, and as a group as a whole, we, we understand that, we know that. And uh, like we spoke to the players about embracing that and going and enjoying the occasion on Sunday. Now I know why your beard is great, because you're old. Stephen Bradley, thanks a million. <laughs> thanks, Jay. Jamie Moore putting the hard questions to Stephen Bradley and Shamrock Rovers manager ahead of Sunday's FAI Cup final. We'll also hear from both women's managers, the Wexford and P-Men side of things after this. And our football coverage is brought to you in association with Paddy Power. For more information on responsible gambling, visit dunlewy.net. Welcome back. Of course, we heard from Stephen Bradley and Vinnie Perth just before the break, uh, ahead of the FAI Cup final on Sunday. Of course, just before that game on Sunday at the Aviva will be the second meeting uh, in as many years, I suppose, of Wexford and Piemont. Let's hear from both managers and that side of things. Piemont and Wexford, we know, met in last year's final with Wexford coming out on top. And Jamie asks Piemont manager James O'Callaghan here whether that'll change their approach this time around. We rolled pretty similar to the way we did last year. You know, I think for some of the players, we have a lot of young players in the team. I think they're a little bit more experienced this year now. Um, last year, we were just all excited to get there. But this year, you know, we really just want to go that one step further. And the Aviva itself is an amazing place to play a football match. And we've heard this week calls for maybe the, the women's game to be on a different day to the men or in Tala Stadium where you might get an 8,000 sellout. I've been covering all the women's national games in Tala. And in recent weeks and months, it's been a great place to, for the girls to play, given it's like full 
this place won't even be full for the men's match. Have you heard that debate and, and what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, I've seen um, that on social media, some of the comments we made. But I think, you know, I think the girls, um, for instance, they really want to play here. I don't think you, you see a lot of the top games get played here, even the Leicester senior finals get, uh, matches get played here. They don't fill it out either. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there should be this big, big thing about whether the women don't fill it, they shouldn't play there. The, the women really want to play there, and it's, I think that's fair enough. And lastly, if your team was to win it and you know, be able to couple with the success of the season in other competitions and stuff, what would that mean to everybody at the club? Listen, P -Mount, you know, the setup in PML in terms of the skilled boy and skilled girl system is really good. You know, they produce lots and lots of players all the time. Um, you know, so for the actual the club, the committee members, the volunteers, everybody involved in P -Mount, you know, for us to win the league was a great achievement and they're all delighted with that. Um, so everybody's just looking forward to putting in a good performance now on Sunday. James, best of luck. Thanks for your time. Great stuff. Thanks, James. Yeah, the women's final takes place at five past midday on Sunday with the men's game not kicking off until 20 to four, which in the past ended with a large proportion of the crowd not actually being in the stadium until after the game has ended. Something that uh, Con Murphy and I raised on Twitter. Um, we wanted some of the uh, women's fans to stay around given the positioning that they have in the stands. But Wexford manager Tom Elms says it doesn't put a dampener on the day for the players. First time I'd heard it was last year when we played here, and I know uh, they kind of packed out the far side of the stadium. Um, and for, all, for for the players we spoke to, you know, they just said, look, they, they wouldn't care if the place was empty. For them, it's about coming to their national stadium and getting an opportunity to play on that pitch. And you know, they they come here and they they see the men's first team. I know, look, you, know, you can argue the women's uh, senior national team don't play here. And I know they packed out Tala the last day, and it's probably something that you know is is what they want to aim towards. But just for our girls, those opportunities maybe don't come come as often um, and for them it was all about just coming out and playing on that surface and, and ha you know being able to say you went and done that but that's the same for me as well as a, as a coach and a manager being able to say that you know I was on the sideline here is it's absolutely fantastic and whilst some of the supporters that came in to watch us would have stayed on and maybe watched the men's game I don't think too many are coming in that little bit earlier to catch our game with the you know with the, with the idea of, of mainly coming in to watch the men's so I mean, maybe it's whether it's easy to organise with the two on the same day. Um, maybe the men's final can kind of overshadow the women's final that little bit. Um, but again, for us, um, it's all about the game. We're just really looking forward to that game and um, preparing as best as we can and coming out with the best result. Yeah, Wexford and Piedmont's gone at it again in the curtain razor. Um, I don't know, if, is it something that sits easily together, two matches that sit easily together in the same way? I, I, I absolutely get the idea behind it. And I think there is hmm. a really solid reasoning behind it. I just feel that they may have outgrown each other. It's it's very well intentioned. I, yeah. think, I don't think I don't think you can hit out at the FAI, for, you know, for this at all. You know, I think it's 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 definitely and 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 how they've tried to push it as cup finals day. Like it's actually probably quite progressive, but I don't think it works. Mm. I think um, I think you know a, a five past twelve kick off. I mean, because there's a fear about extra time and penalties, it has to kick off that early. So as a result, because we've been bitten before, whereby yeah, the penalty shootout was there was, the and there was an issue of the players yeah. warming up and stuff. And that I I just think that while in theory hosting the events together is a good thing, I think in many respects it sort of asserts the, the women's one almost ends up being pitched as the warm up. For the main event, the last thing you want is like of, the curtain raiser. The in terms of crowd thing. size, you know that you have this sort of small crowd for one, and then you know the bigger crowd for the other. Um, but I, I, I can see the thinking behind it. But I, I wonder. The point has been made, and yes, of course, all the players want to play in the Aviva, and the managers there like to stand in the sideline at the Aviva. But like, the senior women's international team doesn't play at the Aviva Stadium. They've actually got a great degree of traction by playing in Tala. Um, and you know, trying to fill Tala or get as close as they can to fill Tala, and maybe you, you know a standalone event that is marketed as the Women's Cup final, and and you get you know you, you, you sort of bus in people and get them to go. That that is the way to go to give those players who who play in front of very small crowds week on week. I mean, I, I went to do a piece with Kilkenny United, the team at the bottom of the Women's National League, and. You know, there's definitely a lot wrong with the Women's National League or a lot to fix, but it's also about building the blocks as well. And I just wonder, it would the best thing for now be to to try and just, just build the game as an event in the calendar and maybe build towards having it at the Aviva again in the years to come and, and maybe not needing it to be 
a warm up for another game or to, to be pitched as part of a package with another game. The worry like, now is it doing something like that would be seen as a backward step and I don't think it necessarily needs to be that. I think he can pitch this as its own thing and have its own crowd and have its own full crowd well, especially when you have Tala that's three sides full and you can get a near set out for a, an international you're going to have four sides and Tala sit enough like this, it could be a really solid venue yeah, for the Munster final. I don't think they can hand out stacks of free tickets for, say, to schoolgirls for the women's final because that whole bottom tier, a lot of those, they are the main seats that are sold to to Shamrock Rovers and Dundalk for the men's game. So, you, so yeah, you can hand out loads of, of tickets to schoolgirls because there will be free seats for the main final. But do you put them up in the rafters then, or do you put them down below and say we need you out? By such a, such a time, or can, can, can time. you go upstairs? You know, later on. So, it, it, there is problems, but it's 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 not like as I said, it's not a case of well, this is an outrage. I think it's a very fair debate, and I mean, and if the bottom line is that the players want to play, well, then that's it. I mean, their season finishes now, so I mean, it is worth pointing out that like the Aviva is open for like the intermediate final, the junior final. Mm. Um, they, I know they put some of them on the same day. But obviously this doesn't work out with the timeline of seasons and so on. But I just think that the, if you're going to grow the women's game seriously, there probably comes a point where you want it to be a standalone event, that the Women's Cup final is a day where people go to the club game. But you, I mean, as it is, you're trying to build the habit of getting people to go to the women's international matches. So maybe the club game just has to take its place and wait for that naturally to come down to them. That there's a drip-down effect, but... Uh, yeah, I can, I can see both sides. I know Ruth Fatty was in here before and I don't want to sort of uh, misrepresent her views, but I think she was more along the lines of the, the Tala aspect. There certainly is that view within some people I think that, yeah, get, get a full stadium for it and that would be better than a sort of a, you know, a, a crowd, a sort of a, a small Rent crowd. A crowd that, yeah. And it has this weird sort of echoey thing because it's such a small crowd in a big stadium. It doesn't, it's not actually always a great spectacle. Mm. Um, Last night we kind of got derailed by events at Anfield. A 5-5 draw, 5-4 in penalties. Cuevy and Callagher goes from conceding five to becoming the hero for Liverpool. I think no more than when we were out of this studio than Jurgen Klopp was sat in his chair in his post-match press conference floating the idea that Liverpool potentially won't even be playing. I'm not concerned somebody else has to be concerned because we didn't make the fixtures, we didn't make the schedule. We, I tell, said it already outside in a TV interview. That the FIFA told us we, the, world, the Team World Cup will be there, you have to come there, so we, we do. The Premier League tells us you have to play the Premier League, but we do obviously, and the, and the Carabao Cup. Um, what we did tonight, and if they don't find a, 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 a place for us, an, a, an appropriate place, not 3 o'clock at Christmas Day or something in the morning, in morning 3 a.m. or at, at Christmas Day, then then we don't play it. So, but they have to make that. You have to think about these things. That you have a fixture list where one team cannot be part of all the games. Then you have to think about a fixture list. And hopefully it starts at one point. Hopefully it starts now. I really think that's fair. That this problem is obvious now. But we will not be the victim of this of this um, problem. We played tonight. We wanted to win it. We wanted. We did that. If they don't find a mo, if they don't find a, a proper date for us, then we cannot play the next round. And whoever's our opponent will go through. Or Arsenal plays it. I cannot change that. But we only we ignored that problem completely for tonight. I think a lot of people from the Premier League were sitting in front of the television, hoping that Arsenal can do it. But I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to give Liverpool, our people, a, a sense of Liverpool's December. Uh, on the 4th of December, they will play Everton at home. On the 7th, three days later, they've got Bournemouth away. Three days after that, they're away to Red Bull Salzburg in the Champions League. Four days after that, they've got Watford visiting Anfield. Three days after that, they supposedly have Villa in the uh, Cup quarter final. That's not going to happen because the day after is when they play a Club World Cup semi final. Three days after that, they play a Club World Cup final. Five days after that, they're away to Leicester, uh, which is on Stevens's day. Three days after that, they will have uh, Wolves at home, and then on the 2nd of January, they will have Sheffield United at Anfield. Um, <laughs> it's lunacy. Like, I know they're victims of their own success, and yeah. the Club World Cup doesn't help matters, and that's you know a completely pointless tournament, etc., etc., etc. But uh, like, we're at a point where something needs to go. Mm. Like, Why don't you send, it, send the kids off to Qatar? <sighs> well, they can't, because they get a dig in the arm from FIFA for going, stop devaluing our competition yeah. that we're looking to grow say, to China in well, 2021. we want to try and win our league here. So, I mean, you put it here. 
there comes like uh, Manchester United obviously had this situation when the FA Cup got sort of binned back in what 2000 was it mm. and at the time obviously the world club competition won out uh, that didn't really like what did, in the long run what did that serve it probably undermined the FA Cup a small bit um, you know maybe 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 you just need a team to go yeah do you know what we're not that if you want to make this World Club Cup a thing well then don't put it in the middle of our season right here now when it's an awkward time for us so we're going to completely devalue it by sending I mean it's getting close to Christmas anyway yeah. so we want to bring our stars all the way around the world when, we're, when you know, we're trying to win a league here we're going to send it if you have a complaint you go on to the FA and say in future member associations if your team wins and gets into this competition well then something here's the steps that we're going to take to amend that season well you know that's not going to happen oh no of course not <laughs> Because it's like it's FIFA and there's money and they're, this thing is getting bigger and going to China in 2021 and there's a whole kit and caboodle around it. Chris Bascom in the Telegraph is reporting this evening that Liverpool are considering fielding two different sides if the games aren't changed. Mm. So, like, let's be honest, it would be the kids that play against Villa. It'd be the Curtis Joneses. It's good, it's good and for Cuevin, actually, to absolutely. be honest as well. He's probably thinking, yeah, go right ahead with this. Yeah. They're, but they're, like, Miguel Delaney was raising the point... Um, earlier on on Twitter today, he says there's a further issue that it dilutes football itself, that like games, any kind of game, is kind of losing its, its sense of value. Say players have less time at the top level, more games mean less. Uh, last night, the Liverpool-Arsenal game, fun as it was, was effectively a fast food match, enjoyable because it was bad and didn't have quality ingredients. Well, we saw him at that point a bit in here last night that this is great fun. But it'll be all forgotten about in two or three days. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's its lasting effect is, is but that's is minimal. But I mean, but that's a broader debate about football in the TV era. I mean, that's just the product of it now. Is you can see everything. It's not like going back to watch the match with Elton Wellsby on a Sunday afternoon, <sighs> and you'd spend a week looking for it. Well, who's the game this week? You'd spend two weeks looking forward to it. They didn't so, even have regular. So I mean, that, I mean, that is a, I mean, that's a very fair point. But that's just a reflection of football generally now that there is there is so much available that everything. You know, everything loses its meaning. Look, what is the point of it all? I mean, maybe this is a road. Like, why do we spend so much time in this endeavour? Good night, everybody. <laughs> like, Football shows you know, the, like, the, like the, there comes a point. I mean, the, like, do you, it is getting to that sort of saturation level. And I can understand, like, what Liverpool really want to do this year, to, to strip it back to the base, is to win the league, mm. right? So I think they'll work backwards from there in everything they do. I think that their problem solving here will start off with you read out you read out all those dates, uh, the games they play. I think like the ones in that are league fixtures, they will be in block capitals or bold mm. on on their fixture list, and everything else will sort of work themselves out. I mean, he put out a pretty youngish team last night. I wouldn't say he would have been too distraught if they'd lost the game last night. It just so happened they went and won it. I'd imagine there was part of him when he saw Divock Origi with that scissor kick in the 94th minute in front of the cop and seeing it go in, thought, oh, but he's like Arsenal can't even beat a team who doesn't want to win. You know? <laughs> like, this is the problem. This is the problem. <laughs> it's a that true they indictment of Unai Emery's reign. Um, so, like, it's, it's created a problem for them. But, I mean, they're just going to have to... Like, are they going to play along with the charade and say, well, this World Club Cup really means something? Yes. I mean, well, look, the United did it in 2000 when they tried to have the Club World Cup meet, like, be one thing and you know, have it like, dotted around the world. Mm. They're trying it again, essentially, in almost the same fashion, but you know, with an expanded format. And like, FIFA are always going to win out. The money is always mm. going to win out. The quarterfinals of the Carabao Cup ain't. And sorry to the people who be heading along to Villa Park on that particular night to see Liverpool because you're going to be seeing a bunch of... It'll be like the friendlies that take place over here when it's... The Dublin Liverpool, Decider. No, it's like a Liverpool selection. Yeah. Liverpool, a Liverpool 11. A Liverpool 11, yeah. yeah. And you see a bunch but that's, of 13 I mean, that, that, that's the price they're going to pay. That is the price they're going to pay. But I mean, I think that it's, it's a mad schedule they have. But I mean, it also, English football is very wedded to, to the tradition of Christmas games. Mm. Um, that is, like, that is, I, mean, I don't know, have Liverpool lobbied? I know Klopp's actually had opinions about the winter break in the past. And obviously, some people who come out from outside are mad for the winter break. They've got an effective um, one, which is like in February, where they've split a couple of games in half and they've opened up this little bit mm. of a, a shallow pool in between. Yeah. But it's like, it's exactly when they don't need it. Like clubs, they kind of need it in around Christmas or January when the weather's biting, the weather's yeah. crap, and fans don't necessarily want to travel half the length of the country to go and see yeah. a, an away match. And it's, it's, a, it's an annoyance for them, but I mean, I think there are smaller clubs and smaller leagues, including some of Rona, play nine games in 27 days in April. You yeah. know, I think the Liverpool players would probably travel in more luxury uh, in this arduous schedule that they face. Ollie Horgan would be looking at that fixture list and be licking his lips at it. Yeah. He'd be thinking the world of this one. Yeah. He'd, be like, he'd be having some he'd of be, that. He, he would absolutely love a trip 
to wherever the Qatar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm now envisaging a dream scenario whereby Ali Horgan is in charge of that uh, second string Liverpool side, not Pep and Linders at Villa Park. Predicting they're going to lose, December. like they're going to lose. Oh, that'd yeah. be spectacular! That'd be spectacular. Um, the business of Richard Kyo um, took another wrinkle. We got further details on it today. Yesterday, we found out that the defender was sacked by Derby because essentially they felt that he had broke protocols regarding the club and his involvement in that accident uh, back in September. Um, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt, which seems to be the crux of the matter from Derby's point of view. They initially wanted to offer him a reduction in his wages, seeing as he's injured and he's not going to be involved and he's coming towards the end of his contract. He is reportedly on, depending who you read, 24 to 29 grand a week. That was going to be chopped down to three mm. a week. And he was told to take this or you can go elsewhere. Now, I presume Derby have done their sums in this. They know they're probably going to be heading to some kind of uh, legal scenario with it and will work out an amenable situation for everybody. Yeah. But again, like we keep coming back to the situation where you can't have sympathy for Richard Kyo, but you can question why his punishment appears more severe than two people who've legitimately broken the law. Yeah, I mean I think the what this I mean, there's no winners in this situation, but Darby County are, are now very much not a winner in this situation in terms of like their response to it is is pretty transparent. You know, they're just looking to save a few quid now from this, you know, they're not, they're not taking a strong moral stand. I wrote this a piece today. They're not taking a moral st strong stand on his actions here. Um, they're taking a strong stance on the person that it's, that it's, that it's easiest to punish right now. Um, and that's not really, like if, if they wanted to, to really take a, a principled stand on this, they would, they would sack all three of them. Yeah. You know? uh, why don't you offer them all a pay cut? You know, tell them all to take a pay cut. Like you know, it's the singling out of of Kyo. I think we I think Richard, as Richard Kyo's other half changed. I think she's put changed her bio on social media to I think wife of wife of a professional scapegoat. Um, wow. And I think that that sums up the, the the how Kyo was feeling right now. I mean, Darby did release a statement after that happened, saying they would support their the rehabilitation of all the people that are involved. Um, they're more so supporting the one. The ones that aren't injured and the ones yeah. that are probably bankable in the yeah year that they have an ad, they have a market value. So um, I, I think you, they they you know no matter how and and what I, I'm sure there's, there's very valid legal arguments have been put forward to Derby to take the stance that they have, but they they've lost any sense of a moral high ground in this topic. That's for sure. Yeah, it's criminal business. Uh, we'll conclude the football show after these. <laughs>